computer. Okay, great. Um, let me start my video here. Uh, welcome everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, attending this month's meeting. Um, we're going to be a little bit informal this month. Um, I do have a speaker planned for next month. He's my uh, wholesaler and uh, he's been killing it lately. And so I asked him to come and talk about wholesaling next month for those of you who are interested in possibly doing wholesaling. Uh, for this month, I wanted to kind of keep it open. And um, I, I want to go over a couple of things and then I just want to open it up to the group. And if there's something that somebody wants to talk about or ask of the group, um, I'll, I'll give you the floor and, and you can ask away. Um, I was on a, another Zoom meeting earlier with a, um, a guy from Think Realty. And uh, he said there is about 800,000 people right now in forbearance. Uh, 10 years ago, when we went through the, the massive downturn foreclosure, um, there were probably about 3 million people that went through foreclosure back then. So we're not as bad as we were 50, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and then the other difference is the people that are on forbearance now, for the majority of them, they do still have equity in their homes. Uh, they are quickly losing that equity because you can imagine here in Orange County, if you're paying $4,000 a month for your mortgage, um, you know, that's, that's hit about $50,000 a year. Um, so who knows how much longer this is going to last, uh, not to bring politics into it, but um, with the, the Democrats, they like to throw money at things and kick the can down the road. So... I, I, I think I see a lot more of the forbearance continuing, um, even though we've put, uh, in the last month, we put six properties under contract to the wholesaler I, I'm, talking, uh, I'm talking about and his team. And most of those are from absentee uh, owners that are living in different states. Their tenants are paying. Um, and we have a, a couple that, um, were in forbearance and, and still don't have jobs. And, you know, so their, their option is, you know, just sell the property and, and take whatever equities in there before they lose all of it. So those are, those are the deals that we've been putting together. Um, and moving forward, we're, you know, we're trying to, to get as many more deals as we can uh, to flip them. This is still an extremely hot market, multiple offers over asking price. Um, it's, it's a pretty crazy world out there right now um, for buyers. You know, the, the, the only saving grace for them is that the interest rates are so low. So uh, anyway, um, with, with January being the month where everybody, um, you know, sets their goals for the year and stuff, um, we, we've set a goal to buy 100 properties this year and flip them. Um, and we did about uh, 30 last year. So, uh, you know, triple our amount from last year is, is a big goal for us. But that's kind of where we're, we're headed and where we're uh, aiming uh, this year. Um, so anyways, let me open it up. Does anybody have anything pressing that they want to talk about or ask the group about? Wow. Don't everybody start at one. I have a question. Okay. Thank you. I have a, I have a question. Hi, I'm Tina. I live in Fullerton um, and I wanted, I'm still in college. So I'm planning on doing my first deal when I start my W2 job just to have income in place. And um, I was looking to get a property in the Inland Empire um, just because price is there, you know, a little bit cheaper and you can buy something that doesn't cost like five hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars um, $700,000. My question is, so when you look at deals and like when you're underwriting deals to see if the numbers make sense, how do you underwrite the rehab costs? Like, does anyone have any tips, advice? Like, do you guys do it per square foot? Like, how do you do it just to make sure that what you underwrite is enough to actually like rehab the property? Anybody want to take that or do you want me to answer? <laughs> Anybody want to throw their two cents in? Well, I can go my idea. So I'll tell you how I do it. And that okay. may or may not help you. 
Uh, normally for me, I, I first have to walk the property because every construction job is different. Uh, I do have a construction background, but I do try to meet with several different GCs or general contractors as well, just to get their input. Uh, but usually if I've walked it with people that expect to maybe put a bid on it, um, it makes it easier for me to tell them what I'm looking to do and for them to put a list together what they think that I might be needing or missing. Um, normally I won't describe that I was a builder or how many flips I've done. I'm trying to get their opinion. And then I would analyze it. Oftentimes the bank or the hard money or the styling I'm using, they'll also send an inspector out to uh, validate the numbers that we're putting together and also point out other things that we might be missing. So even though I might have a preliminary list of things that I think to replace the sheetrock, uh, I can estimate example of just going online and just seeing how much per sheetrock or whatever, but I usually get faster bids from my contractors uh, just to have my rough ideas. And then the inspector will come in. He may budge me up a little bit on here, or a little less on there. Uh, if he thinks I've undercut or overcut my values a little bit. So. so do you walk every single property you analyze? Like I assume not. So how do you like narrow down? Because obviously like, I don't think contractors want to go with you. It's like, look at every single property because obviously you don't close on every single one. No, I normally, um, for one, I, I normally don't get too many properties under contract that I'm going to do without um, being certain I'm moving forward. So normally I would walk every property myself without contractors deciding what I think the reasonable expectation of the job would be. Um, I probably, because I've been doing real estate over 20 years, uh, I think a lot is easier for me to just walk, feel if the foundation feels off, feel if I could smell for the mold, seeing how the gas lines might be set up, if it looks like it had a reroute, how the roof might be sagging, things that I might just notice visually. So finding somebody either in real estate or here or investors or anything that are willing to share time or help bring up or partner a deal or do something to where they can help you see some of those things that might help. And then that way you're only picking properties that you're pretty sure they're close. There may be some stuff you're missing, but no deal killers. Uh, and unless you're doing something where you're just going to wholesale it or, or something different, but, but usually then when I'm taking somebody on, I already know I'm going to do the job. I'm just hoping that I can get it done at the right budget uh, that I feel is fair uh, in my mind, even though I might be only thinking it's a 25 grand job or $250,000 job, whatever. Uh, and they come back a lot higher or lower than, uh, than, then I, I get a little bit stressed. Like on one property, for example, the foundation repairs were astronomical from one bidder and then way too small from another bidder. And I just had to decide on what the actual risk and reward to keeping that property. Was it a long-term keep? Was it worth the risk? But uh, give an example, it's a small job, but it, foundation was 30 grand to three grand. It was like a huge difference. So uh, we were keeping the property as a long-term rental. So it, it didn't matter as much. So we still move forward, but that could have been deal killer. Okay, gosh, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, what I use myself personally, rule of thumb before I get off my uh, chair to go out and look at anything, uh, I'm looking at property at 70% of the after repair value. Um, and then if it meets that criteria, I usually say that it's probably going to cost about 10% to rehab the property. So for, for example, uh, I bought a property the other day for 500 and I know the rehab is gonna be, you know, 50,000 on that property. And that's just a rule of thumb. Uh, like Dante was saying, that gets me off my chair, gets me over there to look at the property and then find out what the actual issues are. Um, I don't do any foundation issues. I, I really much, pretty much shy away from foundation issues because uh, here in California, we're totally disclosure states. You have to disclose that at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of people, you know, look at that and they go, well, I don't want to buy that. You know, it's like if it happened once, it can happen more than once, even though you get it properly fixed. And even though these companies, you know, tell you that uh, there's a 10 or 20 or 30 year guarantee on it. Um, what, what happens if the company goes out of business tomorrow? You know, so there, there goes your guarantee. So that, that personally, that's why I stay away from that stuff. Um, you know, if you're a contractor, you could probably make really, really good money doing properties like that. And, and, and again, that's just a personal thing for me. So as you're looking at properties and you're evaluating, you know, 70% of the ARV, um, and then you can use 10% for um, the rehab costs. Um, and if those, all those numbers work out for you, then, then I would get up and go out and take a look at that property. Okay. 70% ARV, like that's including your rehab costs or just the purchase price? For me, that includes everything. It's just purchase. You know? Okay. 
For me, it includes everything. Yeah. Then what's the ten percent for? Is that isn't the ten percent for the rehab too, or is that in the seventy? Is that's how you the, do it. You do seventy. 70. Yeah, that's in the seventy. And then we're similar. Yeah. I typically, and our margins are a little different. I'm in South Texas right now. We're moving to California this summer, but uh, we we do almost the same thing. We do a fifty percent. Like when we're looking for properties, I want to see that I could probably sell it for double what it's listed for, or close to it. Hope I can get them down. So that way I can have twenty percent room, but. Y'all deal in higher numbers there, so that yours makes better sense. But if you're dealing on a lower number scheme like we are, where we might be buying a property for seventy thousand, example, and then uh, then we need to have at least a twenty percent repair room to cover most even general cosmetics. But if you're buying something for example five hundred thousand, then you're right. Uh, if you could figure that that seventy percent of the save of property is going to be worth eight hundred fifty thousand, seventy percent of that would be five hundred sixty five hundred and Ninety-five thousand dollars. So if you bought it for five hundred, you can rehab it for ninety-five. You'd meet your numbers. That would make it a good idea. And you won't know obviously that you can rehab it for ninety-five because you're so new. But you may say at least there's some room for a decent work job that makes it worth looking at and trying to get closer. Correct. And California is very competitive market, so you know you you may. I mean, we, we've gone up to eighty percent of the after repair value on some properties. Um, but that's because we get out there and we, we know that we're not going to have to use 10% of our, our rehab budget. It'll be, it'll be less. So uh, like Dante says, you, you have to go out and look at these properties just, just to get you out there. Those, those are kind of rule of thumb numbers that, that we use out here in California. Yeah, I walked one just yesterday and the, the issue wasn't the repairs, quote unquote repairs, but the functional obsolescence of the add-ons and the design of the structure uh, made it very difficult. Like it had a remodeled bathroom, but you had to go through bedrooms to get to other bedrooms for the rest of the house. And the bathroom would have to be torn out to create a better flow to where you could have a three bedroom or something that would make more value. And so that was just one of several things that I wouldn't have known by just looking at square footage uh, that it was going to tear down to make more room. And then also without having the central air that it would need and the flat ceilings, it was harder. So, but I wouldn't have been able to tell that without walking it, but it looked good on paper and it still may be okay with today's market. Like he's saying, we're not able to stay quite in that 70 range as we sometimes might go 80 or 85. Otherwise we won't get any investments right? Uh, because there's just not enough properties overall total. And then with rates lower, that also creates people to get cash quicker, which means they invest and flip more. It's just more competitive, um, you know, at least until evictions and the virus thing get better or solved or whatever. Um, I don't hear these two words, functional obsolescence, too often. Dante, can you tell the whole group what that is? Okay, yeah. So um, normally when homes are designed or built, there's a, a normal layout or flow that makes sense. So when you walk into a house, for example, it would be probably strange if the minute you open the door, you were in the restroom. As an example, you usually walk in a house and you're in a living room or a foyer or something like that. So anytime something doesn't make logical sense, it's a functional obsolescence. A lot of times here and probably anywhere, when people add onto their house, they do it just based on what they think will make a game room or make more space. And they don't actually redesign the configuration to where it would make a whole bunch of sense. And same thing here, if I have to, if every time somebody wants to go to my backyard, they've got to walk through my bedroom to go to someone else's bedroom, to go through a door to the backyard, that would be very weird to get max value. You wouldn't see that normally. So anytime that, that's gonna be the case. If, you know, if for example, I've got a eight bedroom house with one bathroom, that might be a different version of functional obsolescence. We'll have people convert a garage into four rooms and try to make a master in another room. So I think the more rooms you have, the more uh, value you may have, but that wouldn't be the case. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. Things like that make it real difficult. Where I see functional obsolescence out here is uh, you'll go into a neighborhood that has single story houses and then all of a sudden you come up on one that has two stories. Obviously they've added a second story on the top. It's what the word says, it's functional, but it's kind of really obsolete for the neighborhood because how do you end up determining what the value is of that property in a neighborhood that has all single stories? So it, it just, Again, functional, but it's kind of obsolete. Uh, and then for all of you who are aspiring to become realtors, uh, that's on the test. It's always been on the test. It's just like, for some reason in California, that's one of the questions, you know, 
what is op functional obsolescence? And then they give you, uh, you know, four little examples. So uh, hopefully everybody knows what that is now. Um, any other questions? Sugar. I have a question. Uh, I'm Julie. I'm a newbie. My first time newbie at investing and just being a sponge right now, trying to gain as much knowledge as I can. Um, I'm excited to hear that next month you're having a wholesale person come on. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I want to specialize here in California. I'm currently doing my first flip, but in Oklahoma. Um, so when you were talking about the 800,000 people in forbearance, is that pre foreclosure or they are in foreclosure? So forbearance is a different term. Uh, forbearance, okay. for, oh, excuse me. Forbearance uh, basically means that um, you can stop legally stop making your home mortgage, and we will uh, not report you to the credit bureaus. We will not call the loan due. All that stuff. Okay. Pre foreclosure. Oh, okay. Pre foreclosure Good. means that they the bank has submitted the paperwork to start that process. Here in California, it's called the notice of default. The notice of default is filed with the county recorder's office, puts everybody on notice that you've stopped making your mortgage payment. Okay. You think those are good leads to go after? Yes, I go after them all the time. Because it's like they're raising their hands going, hey, you know, come bother me, please. You know, um, so that's kind of the process. So forbearance is like everything stop, everything's put on hold. And okay. as long as the bank and the federal government has agreed to all this, and it was it's supposed to end at the end of the month. If the current government, the you know, the current president decides to extend okay. it, then that's possibly what's gonna happen. But we don't know yet. Okay, so so for those people that potentially may be going to pre-foreclosure, they have a lot of they have equity in their house. Um are they, would they be more inclined to working with a wholesaler or what stops them from, you know, going to a realtor instead of a wholesaler? Nothing. You know, why, why would, would they go to? That, that's like any deal. Give you a kind of an idea. After, you know, it's, it's, it's all the same. It's, uh, what, what's the urgency uh, is really the, the main concern. Um, you know, with, with the stuff that we're getting, it's, uh, you know, my tenants aren't paying. They, they haven't paid for seven, eight months. I can't get them to pay. I'm tired of it. Uh, one of the properties, the tenant was her son. And she says, I'm tired of it. I've, you know, he's been doing this his entire life. And I just want to get rid of this property. And you guys, you guys take care of him after you buy it. So it just depends on the urgency. Uh, if, if they're on forbearance and they know they're not going to be able to get a job and start making their payments, then you know yes they can reach out to a real estate agent um it is the, it is at the point where the notice of default gets filed here in california that starts the foreclosure process foreclosure process in california is three months and 21 days now that's the legal process does it happen that quickly no but you know it can so there's an urgency there, you know, it's like, okay, should I just take this guy's cash offer or should I wait a couple of months to see if I can get an offer through a real estate agent? Yes, it might be higher. By the time I pay commissions and closing costs and everything else, you know, I'm, I'm almost the same of, as this cash offer. Maybe I'll get, you know, right. 10,000 less or something. Well, I, I'd rather do this right away. Well, like he's saying, it's the same idea is that a lot of times the people got behind and they're like, I'll call a realtor, I'll do something. And they don't do it. Right. And then time builds, stress builds. And then you, if you come in as a wholesaler, oftentimes it's just like, you're there in their face, you're there now. And you're not asking them to fix something, clean something, pretty right. it up, move the sun out. And the convenience and the timing will make up for it. Although maybe it takes a few communications to develop a bond and trust and to get the pricing in a good number that's where it usually works in, especially distressed, um, uncomfortable situations, tired, you know, timing, things like that. That's exactly right. So how do you find these forbearance owners? Because it's not like you can, can you, you can't go to the county assessor, right? I mean, that's not a pre foreclosure yet. So how do you find forbearance owners? Um, there's, there's list source that's out there. I use property radar. So there's companies out there that keep track of all this stuff. Um, if you're a lender, 
um, or no a lender, you can get um, third, what, what they call them 30, 30 day late, 60 day late and 90 day late. Okay. And these are people that are just like I just said, 30 days late on their payment, 60 and 90 days late on their payment. This, all this information gets reported to the credit bureaus and it, you know, the credit bureaus sell all this information. They make a lot of money with this stuff. Okay. Um, and then there's, like I said, there's other sources out there you can get this information from. Mm -hmm. Well, and on the forbearance, it wouldn't actually show late on the credit because they've worked no. it out usually before they went late. So, yeah. but they will be reported on the credit bureaus as in forbearance. Yes. So even that statement alone probably has a trigger that you could purchase those leads somehow through either the credit bureaus themselves or some sub company that the credit bureaus own that sell off lists. Uh, I know several people that are in forbearance right now that aren't late but they're on like a 90 day forbearance or whatever. And now the thought is they're gonna sell the property at the end or something, they got a plan in place or no plan at all. Um, and they're already getting behind. So on that plan that they even told me that they were gonna do. So at some point they're gonna run out of time and wholesaling may be the only option before it affects their credit. If they're, especially the ones in forbearance might be at least have a chance to protect their credit because it hasn't actually affected them showing the lates. So sometimes a quicker sale, even for less money that just gets it done will be a good leverage point. So credit, can you, are there lists for credit, credit reportings of people's forbearances? And then can, do lenders offer that information to you if 30 day late payments or 60 day late payments? I'm sure those lists exist. I'm, I don't chase wholesale leads. I buy from the wholesalers. So I don't, okay. I don't get those lists, but they, they get those from there. They tell me, Hey, I got this one off a forbearance list or other stuff. Okay. So I know they get them and I'm sure it exists out there very readily. And, you know, anything that can make money, you know, and sell to people lists, uh, they'll do so. So, and I, and I, only reason I don't do the wholesaling side is I'm spending more of my time with the rehab and the construction and the resale of it. So right. there's only so much any person could do that. That's why there's always a job for somebody in real estate doing something. Absolutely. You know, even project managing the, the job rehab is a great help Absolutely. if someone does a really good job. I mean, there's all these little things. So. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Joe, just a question. So what's the process look like once? Once you're buying this property and say there's a tenant on there for, for LA, what kind of process do you have to do to, um, I guess, kick them out? So if you buy a property that has a tenant that's in that pain. Yeah. In, in California, there's actually uh, laws that are on the books that if you're going to do a major rehab of a property, then you can evict for that reason. And it's still in place. What we've been doing is called cash for keys. So we're trying to get cooperation from the tenant. The easiest way to do that is offer them money to get out. Um, so we're, we're spending, uh, when I was buying properties at the courthouse steps, you know, five, six years ago, we were probably spending about $1,000 per person, cash for keys, uh, per, for, per property, not per person. Um, we're probably up to like $5,000 now and sometimes more. I don't want to pay over 10. But when you flash $5,000 in front of somebody, they, they tend to listen. And, and you know, then they say, okay, yeah, for five grand, I'll move out. Uh, so that's kind of what we've been doing is, is offering cash for keys. But at the end of the day, if we don't, uh, we have a, a foreclosure attorney um, that will get them out for, I think he's up to $1,200 now, uh, which is kind of cheap to me. I, you know, I... I you, you think, well, okay, why don't you just, you know, get your attorney to get them out? It's less expensive. It is, but I also run the, the risk that the tenant is going to destroy the place on the way out. So I would, I would rather have them cooperate in the move than, you know, destroy the property. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question. What are the counties that you guys are finding more um, forbearance or properties that make sense to wholesale? Because I'm in Orange County and power right now doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. Um, the, the last property I bought was in Orange County. It's in El Viejo. Viejo. Um, most of the stuff we're getting is in Riverside, San Bernardino. Uh, we've got a duplex that uh, we just put under contract in Compton as well. Um, and I think actually my son-in-law um, is going to wholesale that one. So if anybody is interested in a duplex in Compton, um, 
you know, reach back out uh, to me and then I'll get you in contact with my, with my son-in-law. Um, but, you know, really these are there, they're, they're, they're available. You just have to do the legwork, you know, to find them. Um, I have, I have 15 people um, literally cold calling just on the phone every day, um, just cold calling for us for leads. And so, you know, they, they come across the, the leads and uh, feed them to us. And, you know, if, if they meet our criteria, we buy them. If not, then uh, they'll wholesale them out to somebody else. They're there. Typically, like for, for us, we don't necessarily not do nicer areas or do certain spots. I think a lot of times, like says, is it's a matter of the leads come in. There could be a hoarder or there could be somebody that just outright never took care of a property. I do think you tend to have better shots when properties are older versus newer to have long-term uglier looks that may allow you to get a better pricing and better deals. And plus the a chance to improve the value is there. So like obviously looking at homes that are built in the last 10 years, you could find something maybe, but that would be more difficult that it, even if it was the worst person living there, they can run it down so bad. Maybe they put some holes in the walls, but it's probably not going to be as ugly as a 30 year old or 40 year old or 80 year old property. So sometimes age has a little bit to do with it. Anybody else? Thank anybody you. Else? Anybody else questions want to jump in? Yeah, how you doing? Um, my name is Lucas. I don't have a working camera, which I did for the moment, but I'm on my laptop. Um, just like Julie, myself, um, I'm I'm kind of a newbie to the situation of wholesaling. Um, I really like the community though, and um, how everyone is networking and the options available for it. Um, Dante or Joe, I kind of have a question for you. Um, I'm under looking a property in Kansas City right now. Um, I really want to put it under contract, but um, I can't see the property myself, and my investors can't see it because the property isn't vacant and the tenants don't want it to be shown for another 30 days. And um, I've talked with a couple of buyers. They said the property is just way too much. The seller's asking for way too much in a really bad neighborhood. So I was wondering if you guys had any tips or advice just so I could like talk down sellers, how to negotiate. Cause on my buyer's end, I'm good, but it's just hard getting to the seller standpoint. Um, I'll give mine joke and go his um, for me usually what will happen is it takes the time of getting to know the people and their pressure points and trying to work within them. As an example, when I usually when I first meet somebody that it's going to be a potential wholesale deal, although I don't do the wholesale myself that often, I usually am catching it from a wholesaler just because of my time frame. Um, like I met with a family yesterday and the mom wants to stay in the house and keep it. The daughter wants to be sold. But the, the main thing is, is I came there trying to help trying to see what I could get them. I could probably get an investor to buy this, what pricing they're thinking they're going to want. Just kind of all nice comfort. I'm on their side. I'd like to get it done. I know the stress there. So I, I normally don't try to negotiate the lower pricing in the beginning. I try to get a feel for them, feel for me and where it's going to work. And then I, I like to keep up with them and let them, you know, even during the process and be like, Hey, I know you really do this, you know, with this and this going on, like in that particular house, there's stuff all over the place. There's floor that's got water everywhere that's all ripping up and there's there's stuff that's getting bad just by sitting there that you know that i could use the fact of having yet but i could use the fact that i do have an investor that would pay cash as is but you know right now because of this issue this issue this issue it's there and if it waits longer they're worried that there's going to be more water damage if we get rain or other stuff that's going to happen that's just going to make it not feasible and they're worried about the market and the way things are going to be changing with more foreclosures, prices might be dropping. So I don't know that I'll be able to get you much more than this because of these changes. You know, we got to forecast that getting it, they got to work on it and sell it in the future. And futures don't look good if people start evicting people and then there's a lot more property. So a lot of times I will use realistic market data to counter things and actual repair stuff. But I'll first do it from trying to see what the most I can get. And then after talking to some investors, this is the feedback I'm getting. I think this is the best I'm going to get, which I'll probably say a little lower than I'm willing that I can get from my investors. So hopefully I can negotiate something okay. Because obviously they're always going to want as much as they can get, probably a little bit more than they can get. And obviously your investors are always going to want to get it for less than, than they really could get it for. And it's just, a, it's a battle budgeting their situation. But always listen to your investors before getting it way too under contract. I do know on some cases, we've it's not often because I don't like to work this way too much, 
but in some cases we have gotten it under contract with a lot of stipulations and then got inspections renegotiated and then things didn't go well and so longer times and dropped the pricing, dropped the pricing and just like anything, got it negotiated lower at a, at a lower price. So there is ways to do that. And most of the wholesalers I know, even if they convince them to get it at a certain price, they, they renegotiate it and renegotiate it. Sometimes there's title issues, there's closing issues. So the end price may not even be that beginning price by the end. So sometimes locking it up is okay if you can then bully the pricing on down later. It's work, you know, but I don't know what your thoughts are, Joe, but. Uh, Carlos, you want to unmute and answer that question? Carlos, are you there? Hey, hey, uh, I'm actually driving and I was texting a, a seller because we actually got another one. Well, let me jump, let me park and I'll jump back in if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Uh, my, my two cents, it, it's, it's just a negotiation process. Uh, you know, like, like, like Dante said, you know, find out what their pain points are and, and, and work on that. I know Carlos, uh, you know, he may be working on one deal for three or four months. Uh, you know, literally, I want the moon. And then he calls back a few weeks later, keeps in touch with them, becomes their best friend. Uh, and, and to the point where, you know, if they're really serious, then they start to ask questions and, and maybe ask a, a real estate agent, what's my property really worth? Um, and then finally reality hits. And then hopefully Carlos calls back at the right time and, and they're ready to go. Um, so I, I know that's, that's what, uh, what, what I used to do. Um, and, I know, and I know that's probably what Carlos does. And as soon as he parks and he can give his two cents as well. While we're waiting for that, what I want to do next is I'm going to break you up into smaller groups. So I'm going to put like four people to a room and that way it's going to force you to talk to each other <laughs> and you're going to find out, uh, you know, what's going on with the, with the people in your room, uh, what they're doing. Are they interested in doing something, uh, you know, along those lines? So um, that's, that's what I plan on doing next. We'll do that for about, um, I don't know, about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll come back to the large group like this. And then hopefully somebody says, hey, um, you know, pick somebody's name. Tina's really interesting. And, you know, she said this and this, and I think we ought to talk about it. And so we'll pick it up from there. And then uh, after that, we'll, we'll close out the meeting. Carlos, are you ready? This is California. It takes a while to park the car. <laughs> Especially if you're on the freeway. Carlos. Okay, does anybody have another question while we're waiting? Yeah, I was. I had a uh, question for Dante Miller. He said, uh, you said uh, you were from Texas, you were mo moving back to California. What making you? Uh, I know, <laughs> right? Doing the going, opposite. Going to Texas, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I was born in, in, in Colorado, but raised in Southern California. Um, but no, my uh, uh, one of my daughters, I think, is going to... Um, uh was it Irvine Concordia University in Irvine and uh and I was looking to make a change I, I got divorced here and my other daughter turned 18 and she's going away to college so it just seemed like a time to make a, a change you know and uh I had a very fond childhood there and in my industry and business I could work anywhere really um so it, it just doesn't truly matter I, I don't work tech I don't work anything special there's houses everywhere real estate everywhere so uh, I figured I'd go back, relive some childhood memories, I guess. So, so yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> well, yeah, um, uh, thanks for sharing that. But uh, I was thinking about actually investing in uh, um, Texas. Um, yeah, Texas was... can be good. It's It's got some strong points. Obviously, it's hard, like, like for me to invest anywhere, but where I live is difficult because I, I can't see it, walk it, touch it. So it makes it hard. And I know like with y'all too, same idea, but you work partnerships or you work timing and Hopefully you network enough and you talk to enough people 
and you can work it. Uh, I'd say over here, probably like there, um, construction is difficult. Uh, you know, dealing with contractors, dealing with competition from investors, getting enough cash together to do stuff, um, finding great deals. It's 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 all highly competitive. Just like y'all are wanting to do different stuff, there's not. Oftentimes, it's just the want to do it that's enough to get you in. And if that is enough, it creates a lot of busyness. And from that, it's difficult to get through. But I think if you can find the right team, find the right people, and it's not just about who to trust, but it's also about how you communicate, getting people that know their flaws or what they're not great with. Like for me, I'm not necessarily the greatest with wholesaling because I'm maybe too much of a caring person about the other person. So I can't always get them as low as other people can. So I really like my wholesalers to handle that a lot because um, I'm a positive person, which is great for the resale, staging, decorating, getting high prices, working finances, numbers, but that's my weak point. And, uh, and although I was a builder for several years and rehabber, um, it's difficult to make a lot of money if you care too much about the consumer and not enough about your team. So I, I work my angles where that's certain things I focus. Plus I do so much different stuff um, that uh, I can't sit on a job site for eight hours. So I also work in teamwork with either builders or really good GCs to handle projects, even though I'll tell them what I want done and I have to still check their work and I got to pay attention to them. Um, but it's knowing who you are and what you can bring and finding the right group of team and then everybody being okay with sharing their pieces of that pot. And it's not, not hard necessarily, but a lot of people, even big syndicates and all that stuff make a lot of money, but that doesn't always mean that they're the great team for you. So I don't, it doesn't matter what state. The only reason I like Corpus, even though I'm leaving maybe in, well, in June or July or whatever is the pricing is obviously ridiculous. So, uh, you know, it's like, there's an acre and a half that I'm looking at right now for 69,000. I'm like, well, and we could do apartments there, multifamily. I mean, I buy cash and raise the half million. We need to get that first grouping done. I mean, it's, it's much more feasible mentally for me. Um, just cause I grew up poor and I grew up small town thinking, so I don't have maybe the same background other people do with big corporations and used to doing big, huge situations. So for me, say Southern California might be a little bit intimidating because the prices will be so much higher than I'm used to working with. So it'll take me a little time. So I'll have to find people. That's why I'm starting now, even networking and meeting people that when I get over there, I won't feel so much over my head with just the numbers and the cost. And obviously being here 27 years, I know every niche pretty well i know i'm not investing in robstown i'm not going to go kingsville i'm not gonna like there's things that i i know i know west side's bad north side's worse you know flower bluffs mixed but okay unless you know the base with floods i mean all those things that you're going to gain that's where I'm, I'm developing well that's the same thing too when you're looking to go into a market you find those teams with those situations and i see carlos is even back too but if you got more questions i'm here too <laughs> Carlos. yeah once you uh, uh head on down here uh you know uh, maybe we can hook up and uh, do some deals together. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I really would. Uh, it's it's. I'm just getting out of that box of being in the hometown. I think that's why this COVID thing's kind of cool. Is I would never be on this meeting right then. I'd be networking at a local restaurant or something like that, and that is fine. But in in a small market like mine, especially where it's um, you know, it's three hundred thousand people, and it's it's more of a retirement esh community. You're only going to build so much of your intelligence level and your build level from dealing with just people that only maybe 20 people can think past a certain spot. But like here, we could be from all different parts of town and we could still get together and we might find like-minded people. So hopefully it'll work out good over time. Carlos. Yes, sir. Finally. I forgot, I forgot the question, but go ahead. <laughs> I think for uh, Carlos, they were talking about wholesaling. I think you had something related to how he gets the wholesaling like them to negotiate those prices or do something when that guy had trouble getting the prices lower. Uh, if you had any tips. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's how to negotiate it lower. So, okay. So I'll give you this, this example right now. So the one that we're going to send the contract uh, tomorrow, I literally got out, of, got out of the phone right before I left the office. Um, we our offer is 195. He wanted uh, 220. Right. So, this, this certain situation, there's tenants that haven't been paying. Um, they haven't been paying for the past three months. And then since COVID, is start, since COVID is started, uh, they were paying like half, half the rent, third of the rent, uh, et cetera, right? 
lost your your audio you're on mute you're on mute okay i'm here um so in, in this in this in this specific situation the tenants have been paying uh since covid started and then they were paying like a little bit before that so first conversation with the seller i'm going like hey like besides coming to terms with the price is why is there is there another reason why you're looking to sell and he's like yeah well yeah i have this these tenants that they're being a pain in the butt but that's that's the key question most of the time sellers are not going to be vulnerable they're not going to tell you oh yeah like i have this situation going on and i can't wait to give this property away they're not going to tell you that they're going to be like yeah like give me an offer you know they don't want to be vulnerable so you you got to dig in for that motivation but anyway uh i went to see the property one of my guys went to see it actually and he was taking a couple pictures and then the tenant got mad he's like hey you're going to you're trying to evict me uh, blah 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 you gotta get out right so now i call the seller afterwards and i tell him hey man like like these tenants are gonna be a headache uh they were very disrespectful uh to my uh to one of my reps and they kicked them out they're like cussed them out or whatever um i don't know if we can do uh i don't know if we can work this work, work this deal or whatever uh i'll let you know so right there i'm willing i'm willing to walk away i'm not being desperate for that deal and then i told him i'll call him back I call him back um, after like a few hours or whatever. And he said, I, I was like, I'll, I'll do this for 205. But otherwise I can't go up any higher. And then he brought me down to, he, he got, he, he came down to 215. And then we went back and forth a little bit, but then finally we agreed. But that's, that's pretty much just to keep it short. I'll go in more into that uh, next month on this, but just to keep it short, like dig on the motivation make make them shift make them shift their mindset into as why it's better for them to walk away now as opposed to continuing to to deal with that headache of losing money uh tenants uh, uh biden doing whatever to real estate a lot of people are moving to texas and out of, out of state marking my drop we don't know what might happen all of, all of those points you can emphasize uh so that you can get them to shift that mindset Awesome. Thank you so much for answering my question. Of course. Okay. Uh, let me break you guys up into groups here. Uh, let's see. I think, how many? Let's see. Six, seven, four. Sign automatically. Um, Okay, stand by. We're we're gonna open up these rooms here for you. Okay, so I guess I got left with uh, the best people in uh, on on the meetup, right? Is that right? Arun, are you there? Oh, people are moving. Hey there. Arun, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Joe? Good. How's everything going with your property? Um, so far, so good. You know, um, I'm just uh, waiting, I guess, uh, for a shoe to drop. I, I think most of my tenants are pretty good, except one that I'm concerned about. Um, this is only the second month. You know, all the all the first month payments came in on time, uh, except one. And uh, so I, I, I put a letter uh, on his door today, just uh, reminding him of the options to to pay the rent. Um, so I, I uh, have this uh, online setup for uh, payment of rent that I actually got free through the um, home insurance uh, company. Uh, they had their are affiliated with another online company that provides free management of your property. So the tenants can have their rent deposited directly 
uh, to my account through this website and it's free of charge. So that was, that was a good thing. Okay. Sounds good. I'm, I'm glad your experience is going positive. Yeah. Uh, so far so good. <laughs> Proven, are you there? So uh, question for you, Joe, I, if I was, um, you know, I, I uh, bought this uh, property using a, a, a real estate agent who was a friend of mine and uh, she was just getting into the business and I negotiated a little bit of discount on the commission, but I, I don't know if it was the smartest thing to do because it was, uh, she was very inexperienced and uh, I probably should have hired somebody experienced, but anyway, it, I was able to close the deal but I was, you know, she was just not very knowledgeable. So for the next, I'm thinking I want to buy maybe one more multifamily. So with another experienced agent, um, but I think I have enough experience now to be an investor, to, um, to look for an investor friendly agent who can maybe, you know, give some commission back or give me some discount on the commission. Um, do you know of anyone or, you know, or would you be willing to, you know, we can, uh, of course, chat offline, but um, is that, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. I, I, you know, I can help you out with that. Um, you know, depending on where you're looking, um, I've got a whole, you know, team of agents that, uh, that can help out with uh, your search um, what area are you looking in a particular area? Um, so I, uh, I would probably be more interested in Inland Empire. That's where I, I live in Ontario and the property that uh, I bought is in Upland. It's only 15 minutes away. So it, it, I kind of, I'm like you, I heard you say in one of the meetings that you like to be able to touch the property and have, yeah. you know, be yeah. able to, uh, have it accessible. So I'm kind of the same way and, uh, probably more in the Inland Empire. Area. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. You know, let's, let's talk, uh, you know, uh, later on during the week, if you want, and, uh, we can go from there, you know, yeah. just tell me what, uh, you know, okay. your, your urgency is awesome. and, and what you're looking for. And, um, and I can get started helping you out. Okay. Cool. Hi, Joe. Hey, Jesse. How you doing? Good, good. I, I just, uh, I was in a meeting earlier before the breakout room. But I got a I got a quick call, so I got it out to it. Oh, you got uh, you I mean, got, you've got full access to Pelago now, right? I do, I do. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the quick response. And yeah. uh, I don't know what happened before, but uh, now it's working. Okay, good. It's nice. Okay. Yeah, I would say I was able to generate a nice report to send to my partner that day, and it was beautiful. It was uh. Is is it? Did you make the? Did you make the tool? No, <laughs> no I wish I wish I did. No, I'm I'm the uh, the broker for that company for California, and um, uh, they 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 approached me about four months ago, and asked me to be their broker. They were they are in Washington. They are starting a brokerage here in California and Florida, and they plan on being in all fifty states in the next five years. Uh, so this is oh, you know, okay. kind of a test. And um, so my, my job basically is to hire agents that, um, you know, are, are experienced to deal with investors uh, and on the, on the same token, be investor friendly uh, because our commission splits with the agents are $650 per transaction. So that gives them a lot of freedom to, you know, give away some of their commission if they have to, to make the deal work. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Somehow I, I, I wasn't sure. Like I, I see the, the logo and the brand is somehow associated with your website or your name. Uh, I, I wasn't sure the relationship. I thought you, you're the owner of this platform at that. Oh, damn, yeah. Joe, you, you're good. Yeah. Like no, all software is so good. <laughs> I wish I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's it's my go-to tool to 
to analyze my deal, everything, the, the layout, the, the PDF, the, the spreadsheet, or just very nicely made. Good. Little, uh, application. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, you're welcome, for helping. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 Hey, uh, Joe, uh, can I clarify real quick about the 70% uh, you, you were talking about? Real quick. So. Uh, Okay. When I, when I buy property, it's at seventy percent of the after repair value. So if you go onto the Pelago website right. and it tells you what the after right. repair value is, I'm purchasing that seventy percent right. of that value. If if I can't do it for that, then I, I move on to something else. So seventy percent is your offering price. Correct. Seventy percent or lower. Seventy percent. Seventy percent lower. Maximum. Yes. That's maximum, the maximum. maximum is when, when you say it includes everything, includes 10% rehab, uh, that means that the 10% is part of that 30% uh, room or margin. Correct. Right? If they think that way. Because, because when, when, yeah, because earlier when you said 70% includes 10% rehab, I thought, oh, damn, now you have to offer the 60%, uh, the purchase, like the offer price. But that, that's not what you meant. Correct. Yeah, seventy percent after repair value. Ten percent of that is uh, the rehab cost, and then I also, at the end of the day, you have to sell it. So I throw five percent into selling it. Uh, what's left is anywhere between ten and fifteen percent, and that's my profit. That's your profit. Okay, that makes sense. So basically, you have thirty percent to play. With. You know, thirty percent the margin to play with. That includes rehab money, uh, uh, the escrow, uh, closing, everything, and profits. Correct. So you leave about 30% margin to play with. Correct. Yes. It's actually pretty aggressive, 70%. It's hard to find a 70%, though. I mean, today's market, like you mentioned, sometimes you even have to go as high as 80%. Yes. Yes. That's true. That's yeah. just it's the market. That's the way California competitive. is right now. It's very competitive. Yeah, yeah. Particularly in, in, in LA, in, in Orange County. Yeah. Uh, 70% sometimes it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to find, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Joe, one more thing. Uh, I, it was, through your meet, one of your meetups that I met um, a guy from Indiana. He was on the, I don't know if you remember him. His name was Harsh Rye. He just, he, I think it was your meeting, your meetup and not somebody else's. Actually, I can't, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But anyway, I, I'm just uh, discussing the kind of the advantage of these kind of networking events because I ended up investing with him as well in a property in Indiana. Um, he was, uh, so we, we got into a kind of a JV deal on this uh, 16 unit uh, multifamily in Indiana. So, uh, so thank you for putting these meetups. Oh, you're welcome. And you know, uh, like Dante said, I used to do these in person and it, it's a lot of fun when, it, when it's in person, uh, but obviously this COVID's gonna continue. I, I, I unfortunately don't see an end, even that, this entire year, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 65. And I'm still waiting for my vaccination. You know, it's like <laughs> I don't know. It's I, I don't think I don't think we're gonna fully open back up until next year. You know, I, I hate to say that, but yeah, um, it, it's even it's just, when we do open, you know, people will be kind of gun shy, hesitant about yeah. fully uh mingling you know they might hold back and so i i don't know how that's going to affect everything yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, although I, I agree with with you about uh, the zoom meeting things but though one although one advantage is it actually allows me to attend to a meeting easy more easily because i live in la in pasadena area you know <laughs> it would be far for me to, to drive down i don't know if they meet in um in um, Mission Vail or yeah, mm -hmm. Lake yeah. Paris, I don't know. Where. Yeah, in that area, yeah, yeah that would be that would be far from me. But with the Zoom thing, actually, it's 
it's at least uh, as far as attendance attending goes, it's it's easier for me to attend the meetings. Although, of course, I miss uh, meeting people uh, face to face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you got you got the good and, the, and you have you know the bad. I always like doing things in person. Uh, I, I I love meeting people, you know, and you know having a cup of coffee or coming to the office and and talking about all this stuff. Yeah. But, uh, this this is the next best best thing. I agree. This this is this is good. Yeah, yeah. You have a break room. Although I would love you, uh, I love to take you to lunch or breakfast mm -hmm. sometime when everything settles and to have a coffee uh, or brunch with you. Uh, you know, or for a meeting. Someday. Uh, anytime. Ron, are you there? Can you hear me? Ron? Hey, Joe. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. How are you doing? Uh, you, must, you must have joined late because we're like, we're like in breakout sessions here. But if you want to introduce yourself to the group here, uh, that's fine. Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Sorry I'm late. It's the first opportunity I could jump on. Uh, my name is Ron Herrera, and uh, I live in uh, North Orange County. Uh, I, um, I've flipped houses, I've had rentals, and now I'm an a apartment uh, uh, holder. I've got uh, units in Long Beach, and I'm uh, planning on doing some ADUs and then maybe do some more uh, acquisition. So, um, yeah, that's my story. Thank you. And, and Ron, hey, uh, also, Joe, real quick. Um, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I've been on a call, so I'm almost done. I will join you guys. I, I received a couple prompts to unmute, but uh, I just want to let you know that I've been on a call, so that's why I wasn't able to participate. Okay, that's fine. I just didn't want to leave you out of the conversation. Uh, and, and, and no, uh, way, of course. Okay, uh, Ron, Ron has his own meetup group in uh, North Orange County, and I think he has, or, or maybe you already have, I don't know if you had your meeting yet or not, but uh, he had uh, a speaker on ADUs. Uh, did, did that meeting occur already or is it coming up? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Joe. So yeah, that, um, that meetup was last Tuesday. Um, okay. The gentleman's name is um, Seth, Seth Phillips. And uh, yeah, it was a great, great talk. If anyone needs an ADU referral, um, I, I think you know him too, uh, Joe. But, um, but yeah, if anyone needs that person's referral, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, thanks for mentioning the group too. Yeah, I, I run No Cry. We are kind of the, uh, the North Orange County uh, kind of sister chapter to Joe's group here. Um, we built the group actually based on inspiration from this group uh, years ago. So thanks for uh, letting me plug that, Joe. You're welcome. And when we get back to- Hi, Rob. Uh, I'm sorry, when we get back to everybody, sorry. I'll let you plug it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what's the name of your uh, meetup group or is it on meetup, bro? Yeah, the meetup is called No Cry. It's N-O-C-R-E-I and it, uh, it represents the North Orange County Real Estate Investing. Uh, oh, no and then, yeah, so yeah, feel free to find us on meetup. I, I will, I will, thanks. Okay, let me close out these rooms and get everybody back. And then, and then uh, Ron, if you want to take a few minutes and uh, talk about your group, that's fine with me. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. It says it says they're going to break. All the break rooms will close in fifty seconds. So right, we got to wait a whole minute. <laughs> Hey, Ron, um, this is Arun. Um, I was just curious, since you said you have uh, you have properties in uh, Long Beach, how's the real, like multifamily real estate market there? When I was looking a couple of months ago, there, there were a lot of properties for sale and uh, I, I couldn't find anything reasonable, but do you think uh, it's still pretty strong over there in Long Beach? Yeah, I, uh, I think Long Beach is actually, um, kind of a, a gem among, you know, the, uh, the South Bay and, and all the way down to Orange County for the coastal markets. It's really, um, it's really different. And I think there are a lot of deals. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly getting calls from different brokers trying to, you know, you know, garner some, uh, 
mm-hmm. attention, you know, and, and share some of their deals. And uh, yeah, I think if I was in the position to purchase today, um, yeah, I, that's probably where my, and, and in the future, that's where my next acquisitions will be. There, there's deals. I think the one difference there in that market is you really need to work with a, you know, an agent or a broker that, I mean, knows all those neighborhoods, all those streets, which areas are gentrified, which ones are about to gentrify, so you can get in the in the path of progress there. Um, so if you if you are really interested, um, send me a just send me a, uh, your information on a, on a private message or something. I'll I'll connect you with my broker. Um, he, he's fantastic. Um, I mean, just really knowing like you know where what the deals are, where they are before market, um, and and how to accurately price where valuations will come in after you rehab those places. Um, that's really what makes the difference. Um, but yeah, if you want to talk about that more or talk to my guy, just let me know. Okay, great, thank you. Vaughn, can I ask you a question? What yeah, market sure. is that in? So if you're talking about sub-markets of Long Beach, um, the one that I'm specifically in is uh, Alameda Speed. Okay, got it, thanks. Yeah, I, I flipped a, a another six unit um, in, I don't know if it would be called, it's not Northern Long Beach, but it's, uh, I don't know, at least 10 blocks north of where I am now. And um, yeah, that that was a, a, a little bit different area, a little rougher, still, you know, gentrifying and looking good. But um, uh, but yeah, it, it, there are different sub markets in that area. Ron, you want to take a few minutes, uh, Ron? Um... I've known Rob for quite a bit, um, and he started his own meetup group, and I just want to give him a few minutes to kind of tell you all about it in case you uh, want to, you know, connect with him on his meetup group. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So, um, yeah, it's good to talk to everybody. I'm Ron Herrera. So the group that Joe's referencing is, uh, it's called No Cry, N-O-C-R-E-I. And we are the uh, North Orange County Real Estate Investing Network. And we're coming up on five years um, uh, having uh, run the group this May. It's our fifth year anniversary. And uh, we're a little over 1,200 members. And we have meetings every month, similar to Joe's group. Um, we'll often have guest speakers come in. Um, you know, we, we try to really keep the feel of the group similar to, to Joe's group, where, you know, we're, we're really you know, people with expertise helping other people, you know, not gurus with $10,000 programs or, uh, you know, people who are really trying to, to sell you on something. You know, we, we, we educate each other, we transact and we network. And that's really the tenets of the group. Um, we've got meetings once a month. Um, prior to COVID, we were meeting um, live. And uh, yeah, it, it's a really great opportunity for people to introduce themselves, talk about what they need, um, what they want. If they've got deals, you know, they brought them to the group to transact. And um, yeah, it's, it's, we've created something really special. And like I said, we, we kind of took the tenants of this particular group, uh, meetings that I used to attend, you know, with Joe, you know, five, six years ago. Um, and then, uh, you know, brought uh, something similar with a little different style to, uh, to North Orange County. But ultimately, it's been really great. And um, it's great to, you know, been able to partner with Joe to Bring him in for a few sessions too. He's been a guest speaker at our meetup, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's great. I really appreciate the positive thing you built, Joe, and uh, I'm happy to have tried to replicate it and uh, with some success. So so thanks, Joe. And if anyone wants to participate, especially now that it's a a virtual meetup solely until we're back in person, um, we post on Meetup.com, and uh, we're also um, we also post on Bigger Pockets in the event space. So if anybody has any questions about that, you're welcome to reach out to me here on Meetup. And uh, yeah, appreciate the time. Can you post the link of uh, the Meetup on the chat? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, good call. Thank you. I'm, do- I'm doing that right now. Oh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, there you go. Um, okay, so did anybody uh, learn anything or want to talk about something that you heard? Um, don't want to put anybody on the spot, but um, does anybody have anything to share, talk about? Good yeah, I'll go really quick. Go uh, ahead, Carlos. I'm, I'm really excited 
I'm really excited to be on this and, and I guess speak for uh, next month. If you guys want to follow my Instagram or TikTok, it, I post all real estate stuff. I post uh, live calls of the guys. I post negotiations. Uh, I've closed a couple of deals. And that way, maybe you can have uh, some questions in regards to how I operate or how we operate by, by, in, by next month, right? And yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Carl. Oh, wait, my, I, I already put it, I already put it, I already put it on there as a message. Uh, I think I sent it on the chat. Yeah, I see it. All right, cool. It's up towards the top. If anybody wants to grab that information and, and follow Carlos, uh, um, he's, he's feel he's, free to DM me or whatever. I'll, I'll answer questions. Okay, so anybody else have anything, any any deals that they're working on, uh, anything that they're looking for? I have a question. So this is Megan. Um, I've uh, typically been purchasing product um, uh, homes through conventional financing, and I'm considering looking at probate properties. Just wondering if anyone here has experience with that. Um, there are, there is a, uh, a probate attorney in Orange County that's very famous. Um, I'm trying to think of his, he's so famous, I'm trying to think of his name right now. Um, it's Bell. Pardon me? It's Bell. Um, yeah, I have his contact info, hold on, just let me find it. Um, Bell Gross. Here, here he is. Um, let me, uh, he, he does nothing, no but gross. Probates. he does nothing but probates. And, um, that's where I would get started. Uh, he offers free classes every once in a while. Uh, he offers some that you have to pay, but just look on his website. You'll find a free class from him. And then he has a website where he actually, you know, sells you the probate leads and that's where you're going to get them from. Uh, he explains the process, how it works, all that stuff. I've taken all of his classes. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting guy. Um, that's where I would direct you if you're going to start doing probate uh, and learning the probate process. Um, there, there is an actual court process that, that people go through. Uh, that's what I call a true probate. And then there's a, a, a probate process where you don't need court confirmation. Uh, those are the ones that I would target because the court process takes it nine months to a year to go through. Um, it's just way too much time for me to wait for somebody to decide, you know, whether they can sell their property or not. Uh, so, you know, take a look at that. It looks like there's somebody else on there that uh, you can look at as well. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, I, I have um, sort of looking for a referral or recommendation. I'm looking for a CPA, like that focuses more on real estate. Um, Anybody have a CPA they want to refer? Well, I'm a CPA, but I don't want to take on any more clients. But uh, but I do know I'll, I'll um, I don't know if they're still taking on clients as well, but uh, Amanda Hahn is a friend of mine. Her and her husband are kind of well known on bigger pockets. I worked with them. Oh, uh, the so I, I reached out to Amanda Hahn, and uh, they're not taking on any more clients. But yeah, as I thought, because she reached out to me asking if I wanted to take on some more work. Um, yeah, other than that, I I do not have a re referral. What you, what do you what do you need help with? Is it just tax returns or? Uh, I don't know. I think in the future, um, I I want to start. So I have a huge W two tax liability. So I work in tech um, and then um, I'm trying to like plan out like how to reduce my tax liability, either like just buying properties and redeveloping them or like, I looked at cost segregation stuff as well, but then I'm not entirely sure how to go about that, right? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, um, I would, I would uh, recommend checking out uh, the real estate CPA.com. Um, uh, they, uh, the guy who runs that um, site, and uh, he's a CPA himself. 
he primarily uh, worked with um, people investing in syndication or is running syndications, but he got a lot of really good information on the site about it, just to kind of give you it's a uh, thing to think about question to ask when you're asking CPAs and you're interviewing them and, and things like that to, to give you kind of a more informed it, it's a, a approach to the actual process. Because if you don't know what questions to ask, you're not really going to get the, uh, a, a good advice on what you need in, in my opinion. So I'll check it out. Thanks everyone. I posted my CPA on there. If you're interested, give him a, a, a shout out, reach, reach out to him. He's the one that does all my corporate uh, taxes, uh, all my flipping properties, pretty much everything that uh, me and my team do go through him. So and he's been, he's been doing it for the last four years, five years around there. Um, so he's, he's very versed on all that stuff, including, including the cost segregation stuff as well so um that's his information there Any, anybody else have anything uh just really quickly i posted two links in the chat um it's for bill gross one is his uh, meetup group and the other one is a youtube channel and he hosts uh weekly calls on the subject so for anybody interested um he'd be also another person to to follow okay Uh, one question, uh, another question, Joe. Uh, is there anybody in the group who can chime into what to expect and to expect in terms of uh, return on investment, like for investors and who are interested in investing in multifamily, small multifamily, like maybe it's a fourplex um, or a small commercial property, like what kind of returns should an investor expect in a deal? Like preferred returns and then split of profits after preferred return, those kind of things. Are you talking about investing a passively or as the active partner in the project? Uh, both. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of, um, if you're looking at kind of the small, uh, like one to four unit stuff, uh, honestly, probably one of the better just a simple uh, calculator tool is on bigger pockets. Um, they have their kind of a deal analysis tool and it kind of gives you an expected a return over, you know, like a, uh, a five, 10, 15, 20 year hold period. Um, and while yes, that will be very rough numbers uh, to on, to do ex expected returns on things like uh, in syndications and in passive positions, that kind of uh, uh, rely heavily on what the general partner's strategy is. Are they doing a cost segregation? Are they, are they doing value add? Are they relying on cap rate compression? There's a lot of different things that mm -hmm. will go into kind of the, the understanding of their model. But the best thing that you can do is, is ask them for, you know, um, the editable version of their model. So you can actually dig into it and see what um, assumptions are being used to calculate things in what part of the model. That's really the best kind of way to do it, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um, as far as returns go, um, your, your, goal, your goal should be to write off as much as you can, as much as possible um, to lower your W-2 income if you have W-2 income. Um, I, I know somebody else was talking about that. That That's the purpose really of owning real estate. Um, you know, again, I don't want to bring politics into it, but you can look at the, the last president we had. He had several, you know, multiple years where he, he actually reported a loss uh, on his, uh, you know, income taxes that he carried forward for 10 years. Uh, people don't understand that that's our tax system and he didn't do anything wrong, but um, th that's, that's really should be your goal as, a, as an investor when you're buying these properties is, you know, hopefully have some positive cash flow, but after writing off depreciation and maybe even doing cost segregation, uh, you should have some big write-offs in the first five to 10 years 
of that property and then um, and then decide what you're going to do after that. Move on to, to something else, exchange it, uh, what, whatever it is, whatever your game plan is. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Sorry. Oops, sorry. No, uh, it, 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 go ahead. I, I, I just missed the introduction segment. I was just going to introduce myself. <laughs> But, oh, uh, no, go ahead. It's good, Megan. Uh, you're fine. I can wait. Okay, sorry. I know someone was talking about buying um, using wholesalers, and I just wondered uh, what's the best way to connect with wholesalers, and how do you know that you found a good one? Wow, what a great question. Um, you can find wholesalers anywhere. You go on Facebook. Uh, they're all over Facebook and, and the meetup and groups on Facebook. You can go to meetups like this, and you'll find wholesalers. Um, they're, they're honestly, they're a dime a dozen. The, the question that, that followed up with that was, how do you know if they're good ones? Um, if, if they know what they're doing, they're, you know, in a, in a particular area, like for me, I want them to be 70% of the after repair value. Um, I want them to estimate the rehab correctly. Uh, what they do is they overestimate the ARV and they underestimate the rehab. And that's just uh, simply you just get to know that person. And if they're not giving you the correct numbers, then you move on. You, you move on to somebody else that uh, has a wholesale deal. Um, I've got a website. Let me put it up there for you. So if you're interested, uh, Pelago is an all-inclusive investor-friendly website that you, you put in an address here in California and it'll go through everything for you. It'll show you the comps. Um, it'll, it'll tell you, okay, is this gonna be a light rehab, medium rehab, heavy rehab? If it is, then you should use this number. And then it goes into the flip process and it calculates at the end of the day um, what you wanna buy it for and what you actually get it for. And then it'll tell you whether you're gonna make money on that or a deal or not. Um, so if you get it, if you get a deal from a wholesaler, I would run it through Pelago and, and it'll kind of tell you, okay, this, this is probably a good deal. Um, obviously you always want to go out and look at the property. Like, uh, we talked about earlier, you want to walk the property, you want to do all that stuff to firm up your numbers, but, um, Pelago will get you, you know, 90, 95% of the way, um, in figuring out whether it, it, this is a good deal or not. Uh, but like I said, Wholesalers are, are there. There's a lot of them out there. There's there are a dime a dozen. You just have to find out which ones are the good ones and and which ones are the you know not so good ones, so to speak. I'll just give you my kind of way is uh, I, I focus in target markets, so I know those markets fairly well. I know what I'm looking for. So when I see wholesalers marketing in those locations, obviously I'll reach out to them. Or I'll see the properties. It it doesn't take too long after wasting your time with the wrong wholesaler before you don't waste your time with the wrong wholesalers anymore. So usually you can get an idea once you see a property too, that they weigh over underestimate the repair value, overestimate the after rehab value. Um, and they just, the way they style it, the way they picture it, the way they do their square footage, all certain stuff are different. And then usually along the way, you'll meet several ones that are actually, I don't know, I call it more ethical. It doesn't really matter, but have a way of being that is more upfront, open, makes sense logical that we can all kind of agree on. I'll even have some just because I've been in the lending industry so long and real estate so on that they're like, I'm not really sure about this rehab value. This is what I'm thinking, but come take a look, tell me what you think. So I oftentimes I might get first calls. Even if I don't buy the deal, I, we can come to some conclusion of what we think the rehab will be if I don't get it. But I, I, I like that kind of communication style. So it doesn't mean that I can't find a good deal from a bad wholesaler every now and then, but usually once you isolate to the few good ones that you can really, they know the market, and they know that you're a real buyer uh, too. You got to actually feed them. Otherwise it's a lot of extra effort if you're just not able to take on any of their investments. It'll take some time and usually target marketing to do that. But if you can find a few, you'll be happy. Okay, thank you. Megan, also the, like the first question I would ask is are you direct to sell it, right? Because especially, you know, nowadays, 
everyone is, you know, daisy chaining, daisy chaining, daisy chaining, right? They get a deal from the wholesale, one wholesaler, and then they add a little feed and send out again, and daisy chain, daisy chain, daisy chain. So I think that's always like the first. Um, and, you, you know, I don't know if you clicked or not before, but your, uh, you have to have your money lined up too to make sure you can close quickly. Um, I think everyone has their own preferences, but once you see the deal, is the deal good or the deal bad? You know, bad wholesalers have good deals, good wholesalers have bad deals. You know? um, and then once you see it, you can make your own assessment. I'm going to carry on that daisy high. chain thing too. Just like he's saying, there's a lot of wholesalers that aren't really wholesaling. Just like he's saying there, that they'll say they're wholesaling, but just take it someone else's deal. So if you can get to the actual person, I agree with that hundred percent, the actual person that actually got the deal. And I know some big guys that, you know, that's their, that's the way to do their business, which, you know, look, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. That's their, they're pretty honest with their end buyers and make a small cut. If they're fine with it. It's just high, high volume transaction, you know, as well. So, um, and, and, and transparently, you know, I'm, I'm a wholesaler, you know, I do this extremely part-time. I have a big W2, but I talk to all my buyers and I kind of always ask like, what do you like, what do you dislike? Like, I don't even like me personally, I don't even um, give estimated rehab money because I don't, I don't, I don't flip. So it would be a guesstimate at best, but I do have pictures. I have a video, I have a walkthrough, you know, I know the age of the roof. I know uh, Asian I know how old the AC unit, like I know the, the facts that I need to know. And then I let them see it and make their own assessment. And then I get it at the price that I think, and then we go from there, you know? So um, I'm very systematic, it's a little bit different. And I, I have had, you know, deals from other wholesalers that couldn't close on it. They gave it to me, we renegotiated. I got a new contract and sent it out. But I would specifically ask, you know, are you direct to sell it? That's very important, I think. Because you just there's so many unknowns when you don't when you are not direct to sell, right? So, anyways. Okay, I think that's um, that was really valuable. Thanks, Charles. Um, but in addition to that, how since you're a wholesaler, how do you find your buyers? Um, respectfully, buyers are a dime a dozen, <laughs> just like wholesalers, right? Um, I do have a I have a very large buyer pool um, when I got coached. That was actually how I started. Um, my best friend's a GC. My father-in-law's a GC. Everyone, you know, I have hard money lenders that are like begging me to take the money. I just don't like flipping. I don't want to wait three, four months for my money. I like getting paid in three days because um, I have a very big W-2 and I have four kids. Um, so for me, there's, it's not that hard. Um, once you get a deal, you can just, the easy way, if you really want to do it, I don't do it like this anymore, but you can just put it on Facebook and let's say, you know, um, groups that they were saying, you know, I've got a deal in Anaheim. You get the zip code if you want. Don't give too much information. Anyone interested, you're going to get bombarded with wholesalers. That's why I don't do it. Um, everyone, oh, I buy, I'm a direct seller, the new Westerns out there, out there you know, no disrespect to them. Um, I, I reverse engineer, you know, whenever I get a deal, I always send it to my buyers first, but I'm always trying to add. So I look at who flipped in the area within, uh, you know, mile to three miles. And I'll either call them directly or I'll call the agent directly and say, hey, I've got a deal. This is, you know, this is what we're looking at. It's actually, you know, 20 grand below what you bought it for. Same square footage. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm very systematic about it. So um, that's the way I do it. You know, that's the easiest way to do it, to be honest. Um, Craigslist, you know, I know a lot of people get, you know, just put up, you know, hey, I'm, you know, we got an opportunity, we got a deal, this and that. We'll get that one. Um, finding, finding buyers is very, very easy if you have a good deal. Um, how willing yeah, are, and, and, are homeowners, how willing are homeowners um, for, you know, a wholesaler to come in and take pictures of their house and come in and look at everything? Is is that hard to get agreement for homeowners to do that? Our business quadrupled from 19 to 2020. Um, and I, I literally worked the business five, you know, maybe five, 10 hours a week, if even that. But they are very open to it. But you know, we always had gloves, masks, etc. Some we don't even see. like. I just did one today. I haven't even seen it. Yet. I drove by it because it's down the street from my house. I live in Irvine, so um, people are very open to it. And if they're not, you can do a virtual one. I've done a virtual one. We literally we got on Google Duo and just you know she walked me around the house. And um, one of them I've recorded before, you know, but I always do a walkthrough. But like I said, if they're motivated, you know 
they're not going to be as worried about that, you know, when they are, but we haven't had anyone, we haven't had any deals be a problem because people are comfortable with us coming to the house. Where do you get most of your deals? Um, networking, we do a lot of outbound, we do Facebook ads, um, agents, um, we do texting, some cold calling, but we do a lot of um, outreach, but uh, we do Facebook ads and I do uh, YouTube ads like that too. We've had a lot from agents recently. Um, Praveen, uh, you said, you can you address the group? Sure. Are you still there? I am. Hi guys. Uh, I, I joined the group because I'm working on a real estate portal, a real estate website, and I'm hoping to speak with realtors or people in the industry who use these online platforms. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my number in the chat and anyone who, you know, you can just send me a text message. It'll take, you know, five to 10 minutes. I'm going to talk to you about which online tools you're using, um, you know, what you like about them, what you dislike, any ideas you have, anything you can imagine, I ultimately want to build into my platform. So I've been working on it for several years. This is my last push. Uh, I did a lot of customer discovery in 2016 and 2017. Uh, I'm going to launch in mid-March to early April. So this is the last round. I'm just, you know, uh, covering my bases. A lot has changed in terms of technology. So I just want to talk to people about what they, they like the most and what they'd like to see. What would help them either finding properties, um, you know, finding tenants or buyers, whatever it might be. So yeah, I, I put my number in chat and uh, I, anyone who wants to talk to me five to 10 minutes, I'd greatly appreciate it. So just send me a text with your name and what you do, and then we'll set up a time to speak. Okay. Uh, for those and, of you- and thanks, for, thanks for hosting this, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you who are looking to flip properties, I put my, the book that I wrote on flipping properties here in Orange County. There's a link to it there if you're interested. Um, it's 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 not as easy as you see on TV. Um, it, it is very rewarding and, and lots of fun, uh, but it's something that you need to educate yourself with, uh, and, and that's a good place to start. Does anybody have anything else? Uh, yeah, I, I just love to just introduce myself. Um, uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I I've been investing now for. Uh, almost 24 years uh, is at this point started really young dragging my parents up on properties. Um, but I've been in kind of all areas of the industry that you can possibly imagine. Um, I own property, I flip property. Um, I've worked for institutional property managers for private equity firms for hedge funds. Um, I, uh, I started my own PE, uh, PE firm. It's that I bought a bunch of property in. Uh, now I'm working more on the technology side of the business, uh, specifically in the it's capital it's a capital allocation area. So uh, if my if my platform Coralink is kind of like a hard money lending platform, where if you can submit a deal and then it will get you dozens of terms back from you know, the, the hundreds of lenders in our network. Um, so basically, as many people as are interested in the deal will get you terms from them, and then you can kind of pick and choose which terms work best for you. It, it's your specific deal. Um, and then I have a capital, it's place of business that uh, uh, primarily works for uh, with syndicators and, and large real estate investors uh, to source its European, its MENA region, as well as Southeast Asia capital to its purchase uh, its US based assets. And then I ha actually have a development going on in the LA area right now as well. So kind of been all, all over the industry. So I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions and whatnot. Thank you, Michael, appreciate it. Uh, anybody else have any comments or questions? Well, is there any way to get everybody's contact information? You can reach out one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't, I don't have that information. Uh, meetup group does not share that. Um, if somebody 
if you guys want to post your information on there, um, I'll leave this open for a while till everybody grabs their information. Um, if you want to do it that way, that's fine with me. Yeah, uh, and just a note on that, if you drop it in the chat, uh, there's a little three buttons on the side of the chat window. Uh, if you can save the entire chat log, so you can go back and look up people's um, email addresses or phone numbers or whatever you need based on that. So that makes it easier than trying to write it all down. Yeah, I just put my contact information and Joe, yeah, it'll be great if you can leave it open for a bit and then we can download the chat log and get everybody's contact. That's fine. I'm, uh, I'll stay on until everybody says good night. <laughs> Uh, Joe, do you know if uh, anybody who does cost segregation uh, uh, in this group? If, if you contact my CPA, he has somebody that does that. Um, I, I did one of my meetups was a cost segregation person. If you look on my meetups and look like maybe a year or a year and a half ago, look through, look through my meetups their information should be on there someplace. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and there's also um, like it's websites and kind of a technology system where you can, you can do it yourself, uh, depending on how complicated the project is, you know, that may or may not be a good idea, uh, okay. but there are, a, there are resources for that as well. Oh, I see, okay, good to know. I had a question. Have you ever done, has anyone ever done their own cost segregation study and like it worked? Uh, not anyone that I know personally, but it's, it's more about just isolating the land from the structure, from the, you know, uh, a, a sub five year consumable to the uh, a five to 10 year consumables. And then the 15 year consumable, that's really all it comes down to. And then it's, uh, it's taking the accelerated appreciation on that. Now, whether you, you know, if there's a, a tax bill that's passed, whether you'll still be able to do the, the accelerated depreciation is kind of up in, you know, uh, up for question, but there's still gonna be advantages for doing it. It just may not be as great. And I'd be, I'd be very careful doing your own. Um, you know, the, the purpose of having a company do it is that they're independent and they're experts at it. And the, the reason that you do it is in case you get audited. Uh, the chances of getting audited are really small, but if you do get audited, I would prefer to have something in writing from another company that said, hey, I can write off all this stuff instead of, you know, looking at the tax guy across the table and telling them, yeah, I, I did this myself. So I'd be very careful doing it yourself. I have a question. I do a uh, rent by the room in big houses and um, starting to evaluate small multifamily in San Bernardino area. Does anyone have any recommendations for a property manager? Um, I think that'd be a good first step to understanding the market a little bit better. I, I don't have any. Anybody, anybody? Crickets? Yeah. <laughs> you go, go on Facebook, <laughs> find, find the Facebook groups in that area and uh, ask the same question on the Facebook group and you, you'll get uh, a lot of responses. Um, for, you know, property managers are, are, are kind of a pain point when you have a, a property to manage. Um, they're like, for flippers, uh, the pain point is contractors. Um, but um, yeah, you, you have to really be careful who you hire as a property manager and what they charge you. I do, I do property management here in Orange County, but I don't go out of Orange County. And most of the property management stuff that I do are for um, local investor clients that I have myself. And you really just do it as a courtesy for them and, and I don't charge a lot of money, but um, you, you have to be careful with property managers. Gotcha, yeah, I, I self-managed so far. Um, 
since it's uh, rent by the room, it's a lot of work. I'm not, not looking to off, uh, off source that yet, but if I'm, you know, I'm in Culver City, if I want to do something in San Bernardino, I want to have someone there. Do you, Just own a little closer. do you own the property? The one now? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes? Hmm. Yeah, I do, oh, I do. I, I, do I, I, I know some people that don't own the property and they're doing the same thing you are. They're just they're just renting it and then they're renting out the rooms. Master I, lease kind of situation. Yeah, I was just curious which which type of uh, investor you were. So you you actually own the property, which which is good. Yeah, um, I, I see how people do it through the lease because I look at all, a lot of them and a lot of them would make sense if I just were to rent it from the the seller or just rent it in general. So it's easier to get into um, versus you need a little bit more of an income to be able to purchase it to, for it to make sense. Yeah. If you have, um, if you're willing to connect me with any of, the, of those investors that work on those, um, remember the room kind of big houses, I would love that. Okay. Joe. Okay. Um, yeah, and then to, to add just one note to that, uh, Dante, um, uh, try searching for a Facebook group in that general region that's specific to like the short-term rental stuff because they'll have a lot more specific answers and we'll have probably a, a better recommendation in terms of finding property managers that are understand that property class and you know it's like that asset type um just because they'll work with them more that makes sense yeah. uh, anybody else any need, need more time to Post your information. Are we good? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna close the meeting. Then thank you all for coming. Um, hold on, I say I would love an intro to the peeps. You know, doing rant. Oh, okay, got it. Um, I'll send you my contact. Hold on, okay. I'll end it. Okay, got it. Uh, I will see you guys next month then. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, wholesaling. Okay. So uh, again, thank you for uh, showing up this month and spending almost a couple of hours with me. I appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joe.